Cool, thanks. How's everybody doing? This is sort of like the blessing, I guess, to be the last. Do people need to stand up and shake out? Are you you're okay? Cool. Um, so yes, I'm the head of talent management for Ericsson, but I like to refer to myself to, as a people philanthropist. I like to improve the lives of the people around me, but that didn't pass our, our comms department, so I had to write this. <laughs> Um, so I, I'm feeling pretty full, actually. I guess perhaps many of you are as well. It's been a great day of learning, uh, insights, and um, a lot of great conversations with many of you. And to sort of show that I'm a pretty fast learner, I was feeling sort of, whew, have to keep people engaged and uh, maybe not entertained, but at least interested. But I'm gonna use, um, take the ball from Marshall and and throw it out to the audience and say, um, what have I, have I done my best to, dot, dot, dot. So my challenge to you is to just maybe quickly think about, did I do my best to stay curious, to stay engaged, to capture one nugget of learning that I can take with me? And, and that is actually, I guess, all that I'm asking. Um, as I tell a little bit about my story at Ericsson. And that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell a little bit about Ericsson, a little bit about what informs us of why purpose is important, and then tell you a little bit about initiative that we're doing to try to increase the chances of having um, purpose-driven leaders. Sound okay? Okay, Ericsson, we are one of the leading information communication and telecoms uh, organization. That means we are providing the network traffic for 40% of the traffic around the world. We have over 120,000 employees in over 180 countries. So you sort of start to get the complexity of, of who we're doing. We're 75% engineers um, and evolving, transforming all the time. We are very grounded in our vision and mission and values, and this is something that I'm really proud of. But one of the most uh, things that I'm most proud of is actually how we encourage and promote that if you are going to be at Ericsson, you need to feel comfortable with your values. And if they're not aligned with the company values, then it's probably not a good fit. So that's just the starting point, and I think that that's something very powerful. It's not just something that we say, we really believe it. Now, I've had uh, a lot of help from uh, many who have just spoken uh, before me about the changing world that we're living in, the VUCA world, um, things transitioning and moving at a rapid pace. Um, and that's something that's important that informs the work that we do around development at Ericsson. We also have our strategy in place, and then sort of the rising expectations on our leaders, but then every employee in the organization. So that's a little bit about what informs why we're doing some of the work that we're doing around purpose. How many of you have actually done some purpose work? Finding your meaning. Come on, this is an HR group. Uh, has it been helpful or just confusing? <laughs> Uh, helpful. Well, I hope so. I'll tell you a little bit about what we're doing, and then, um, and then you can maybe ask some questions about uh, some, or even tell us about some of the things that you're doing and seeing if we can make some sense of it together. Cool. So the purpose movement. Um, it is in hundreds of books. It is in mainstream magazines, in academic journals, and even modern pop artists. My eight-year-old daughter, she was not sure if she should be really impressed or completely embarrassed as I was listening to Justin Bieber's new Purpose album, which he's going on tour. It's everywhere around us. And sometimes these buzzwords start to lose a little bit of, of power. I had one of uh, my leaders in the organization who's gone through the initiative that, that I'll tell you a little bit about. And she said, Selena, you know, this word purpose, it's kind of like, oh boring me. Okay, well, well, tell me what's going on. She's like, because it's something. And she was telling, well, you know, after I've been through this initiative and we've done a lot of follow-up, I really noticed that even though I have so much work and I'm so physically tired, 
I have an amazing amount of energy. I notice that even though I'm getting so much information all of the time, I'm able to really focus. And although my team is really feeling the stress and pressure, we know, we believe we're working on the right things. I said, Nadine, that sounds fantastic. You know what? You can call it whatever the hell you want to call it if it's not purpose. And she sort of laughed and smiled and looked at me and she said, okay, you win, Selena. I have my purpose and it's helping me with my direction. So we've heard a, a little bit from Viktor Frankl who's influenced the work that I've done also earlier from Marshall. And he really put it, I think, very poignantly. But it is about how we choose. Our attitude, we just heard about mindset, a growth mindset <coughs> instead of a fixed mindset. And that really leads to some of the things I just want to tell you briefly about what we believe around purpose at Ericsson. And it's influenced by a very good friend of mine, Richard Leader, who's, who's written a number of books on purpose and is actually an instrumental part of the initiative that we run. So the first thing is, I really believe that purpose is a choice. Right? We decide what it is. We decide how we act upon it. We make that decision. We're in control. It's a practice. I'm sure many of you are athletes or musicians. We heard from Marshall also around just the change, the behavior change that we're all working on in our own organizations. It doesn't come easy. We just don't say, okay, I've got, I've got my purpose, and then it just all falls into place. It takes some rigor, it takes practice. We believe that it's actually something outside yourself. Okay? While we think that purpose is deeply personal, we also have a sense that it's very social. There has to be something about improving the lives of others in a purpose. I think E.B. White said it very well, very well when, she, when she talked about this, so that it is really about making the tough choices, but they are impacting the rest of the world. Okay, another big piece is that it's believing that you actually have one, and also that it's not a luxury. We'll meet uh, Angela, one of the um, NGO leaders that we work quite closely with in, in, in um, Tanzania in, in a few minutes. And um, she is someone who really had nothing. She uh, was diagnosed HIV positive um, after being raped by somebody in her community. She was tossed out by her community and her family. And what did she do? She decided that her purpose was to take away the stigma, stigma it, it was of being HIV positive and being a woman and being raped. This is not a Western world thing. This is about every human's right to have a purpose and let that drive what you focus on in your life. And the ultimate question, which feels very dramatic, it feels like maybe there's been a lot of ultimate questions today, um, but the two ultimate questions that we talk about are the two most important days in our life. What are those? Do people know two most important days? Yes, there's maybe not only a right answer. Any ideas? Birth and death? Thank you. He was a plant. <laughs> you and Mark Twain. I think really great, and I think that's been um, particularly true for me, and part of this is, uh, I guess, a story about me, is that really around why am I here? What am I burning for? When I feel it really in my gut, an important day. Okay, so global perspectives. And uh, that's the initiative that we have at Ericsson, uh, as I mentioned, to actually help to increase the chances of having purpose-driven leaders. And sometimes, as I said, with some of this reaction around purpose, and um, I'm a believer in that words build worlds, of course we need to translate it into our own way at Ericsson. And we do it like this. We, we talk about complete leaders. And we talk about leaders that have their head, heart, and guts. We hire really smart people. Right? 
That's sort of a criteria for coming in, but it's not enough. Being smart is not enough. We also say you have to use your guts, a little bit of an American term, but it's about taking risks. You know, Howard uh, talked this morning about taking risks. He said, you have to know when you need to stand up and be heard. I thought that was really powerful. When to take the risks. And it's about heart, and this is really about emotional intelligence, and this is sort of the root of the purpose piece, although I think the purpose for us is a red thread that goes across. Okay? So, um, what makes a great learning experience, and how are we actually seeing leaders uh, that are making a difference, and that uh, this experience is actually, you know, the famous that we're all accountable for, return on investment. We're seeing people change, we're seeing a behavior shift. And so we really spend a lot of time actually in talking about what this is all about. We ask leaders to um, write a short paragraph that is actually sort of, we, we call it a, sort of a, an entrance a paragraph um, that they have to apply for the program, although they've been rigorously nominated. And that is around, again, accountability. And a little bit, again, about what Marshall spoke about this morning is taking ownership for the learning, not showing up as a consumer, not showing up as someone who will be fed information. This is a very active participant initiative. So we talk about the shared experience. It's very team-oriented. So um, this is about bringing leaders in from all over the organization, about 30 of them, and really saying, how are you gonna work together? How are you gonna make a difference together in this experience and when you go back in the organization? Structured reflection. Um, I'm not sure if it's built into this program, actually, but maybe we could do that. Um, I think structured reflection is so important. We're so busy, and to take the actual time to say, what, what's the impact on me? What did I learn? What is the nugget that I want to keep and take with it? We really push people. We do some um, unorthodox things. So the new territory, I think, is pretty broad. It's all experiential. And while, again, as Nadine said, that it's exhausting, 100% is that we find people are energized after it. But at the base of it, it is around real and relevant issues. And that is where our executive team comes into play. This is our CEO, Hans Vesbury. He and the rest of the executive team are extremely uh, involved and supportive of this initiative. Uh, Hans writes um, four to six projects each year, which they're actually actively working on um, in the program. Uh, both, there's a, a week in Tanzania, then they have a few months where they're rigorously working on this, and then another work in, uh, week in Boston. Real issues, real projects, all of them that get implemented. This is around getting cross-functional leaders smart, talented, who have already have a, a strong performance track record and potential, and saying, how do we solve some of our really critical issues in the organization? So Hans is very much involved in the, in the whole program and is the receiver of, of these projects at the end. So the experience in Tanzania. What we try to create is uh, a learning experience that is putting everybody on the edge. So we are in uh, rural Arusha, and we are not staying at luxury hotels. Um, we usually are at very um, local hotels run by local Tanzanians. Um, if you get a hot shower at any point during the, the week, or actually 10 days, you're pretty lucky. Although I have to say, by the end of the week, the complaints are zero. You know, the first day of sort of the freezing cold shower coming on, people are like, ah. Oh. But things get into perspective. That cold shower seems pretty minimal by the end of the 10 days. We take visits to schools. We have our own tab labs and millennial villages that Ericsson supports, but also to orphanages, um, to homes. Uh, and a number of different clinics and uh, hospitals are, are in the area that are really working with um, the local people. And 
what we, what we hear, what we see, you know, we, we bring in the premise of the NGOs that we're going to bring these NGO leaders and we sponsor uh, about 10 of them to come and actually experience the program with us. We're going to help them and coach them. Who actually gets the coaching? Who actually gets the real impact from that interaction? It's the leaders at Ericsson that win on that one. Has anybody complained about um, having to do a lot of work with limited resources? Talk to some of the NGO leaders. Having to complain about getting your team rallied up? Talk to some of the NGO leaders. They know what it means to lead with purpose. They're great role models for our leaders. And the last thing that we do is the homestays, which um, is an opportunity for our, our executives to really have a chance to experience the individuals that we're interacting with. 90% of these homes do not have running water and do not have indoor plumbing. So for some of, some of our leaders, it's, it's uncomfortable. It's not the Regency. So I, I'll actually let them tell you a little bit about it themselves. <coughs> The overnight stay is really designed to let our executives have a small taste of the NGO leaders' daily lives, to see their daily challenges and how, as a community, they rise up and make something better. simplicity of how they live. When they showed me my room, they had simply cleaned out the whole room for me. And I tried to argue with them that I should. I mean, I can sleep on the floor where I can take notes and stay in the room. It's the first time that I've been so close to an HIV positive person. It's amazing to see that with what she had gone through, she still has this fantastic view of the world. She's so happy. And then of course seeing her three beautiful children was also really amazing. Uh, the evening went on and we sat down so she could tell her story. She got raped, which was how she conceived HIV. It's hard not to get touched by it. How it affected her life, how um, her neighbors and family looked at her. She decided that she wanted to make a difference. Yeah, so then later on in the evening we had dinner together. Um, I don't know what I really expected, but what I got was very nice. <laughs> they had made meat, rice, they had done something called ugali, which I liked. The evening was, even though uh, filled with very serious conversations, was filled with laughter all the time and I think that is primarily due to Angela. As I said, she has such a joyous view of uh, her life. It was a good night. It's 
I kind of took on the responsibility of making ugali the next morning for everyone. We sat down and I was actually assisted in making ugali and that was good fun. It turned out uh, well and we ate the ugali uh, for breakfast. So now I know how to make ugali. Being here in Tanzania has really allowed me to reflect over my past but also think about my future. It has given me the opportunity of coming closer to uh, my beliefs, my values and it's definitely reinforcing my feeling of having a purpose in life and purpose with your leadership. I was just thinking we almost have to end that frame with uh, the picture of Angela smiling. Um, she's truly one of my heroes. She's a, a dynamic woman and this, this is actually from three years ago, but since then, She's actually taken the initiative to, to organize many of the other NGO leaders, um, to really bring back the learnings around um, creating a purpose to her team, her organization. She's trying to see opportunities to share it with other NGOs that we're not able to reach. Really amazing, uh, inspiring woman. Um, some of the other things that we do is that we actually really try to use the resource around us. So this is the Gnori Gnori Crater, um, one of the most beautiful places uh, on earth, according to me. <laughs> um, we spend some time in there in a safari, and okay, you think, ah, so you go on a safari. But it's really about looking at the ecosystem. Has anybody ever been to the crater? So you know, you can tell, you, you stand up at the top before you go down into the crater and it just sort of looks like a big green field. You think, this is going to be kind of boring, we're just going to sort of drive around in the field. But when you actually get down into the crater, it is this amazing ecosystem of animals living and thriving together. There are lions and zebras and giraffes and... Um, uh, Swahili, you know, natives from the or area, they're together, living together. And of course, sometimes somebody gets eaten. Um, <laughs> but it's amazing to go down there and see. We have the opportunity, this picture is actually um, last year when we were sitting in the crater. And um, we, you know, for those who uh, are concerned about health and safety, there actually are armed guard, guards <laughs> right behind us because it is a, an open, you know, it's not a zoo um, area. And um, we really talk about what, what is all this about? What, how does this impact how we think about organizations and how we can work together? And how can we remove sort of the competitiveness to create something where we can all be harmony and working together to preserve something that's sort of bigger than any one of us? Um, this particular time, and I guess I wanted to share this because actually each, each time is a unique experience and, and filled with sort of magical moments. And this magical moments was we had these three beautiful elephants um, come right behind us as we were really talking, you know, walked right behind Richard, who's there sitting in front of the tree as we um, were talking around purpose and around making this connection with the beautiful surroundings where we're in organizations and, and our roles as leaders. And it was just so powerful to have these amazing beasts who can be quite dangerous. They were 50 meters away. And you know, the guards were getting a little bit nervous because if, if you know, actually, elephants can be quite aggressive animals. But there was something so peaceful about them showing up, almost like they were sort of watching us and curious sort of hard to explain, but it's pretty magical moments that this is all built on. And then we bring it down, and, and one of the things we try to emphasize is making a difference in one person's life every day. Because it can get sort of over, overwhelming when we're sitting there and we're helping and working with NGOs, and how do we sort of save the world? Okay, or how do we make a difference to one person, make things better? This is... Uh, uh, an equation that actually Richard uses, but I think that maybe, maybe it's one of the tidbits you can take and it's an easy way to talk about it. 
So what are your gifts? What are you actually good at? We've talked about strength finders and really leveraging your strengths. What are some of the things that you're really good at? What are you passionate about? What are you really burning for? And what do you believe in? What are your values? And that's really what your calling is. That's the purpose. That's really being your true, true self, authentic leaders. Now, um, there is a, a second session, which is a very important part of this also, and is not a stop-start. As you can imagine, we do quite a bit of work to re-entering the workplace. So we've just thrown them into this 10-day experience that's pretty intense, and then they need to go back to reality, to timelines and projects and deliverables. So we really try to support them to do, do that um, transition and then a few months later, bringing them to Boston and saying, how do we bring Africa, Tanzania, those learnings into the conversations we're having about our strategic direction, around executing against our goals, around design thinking. So we, we talk about design thinking and rapid prototyping in Tanzania. What does that look like there with limited resources? How do we make mistakes quickly, early, and bounce back? and then the presentation to Hans, which is a very um, personal, it's very structured, as I said, it's a very practical business um, project that they're presenting to. Um, these aren't executives let, yet, so we call them emerging executives, so it's actually probably the first time that many of them have had the opportunity to present directly to our CEO. And it's a really uh, powerful experience for them in terms of being incentivized to say, you know what, the leadership team, they believe in what we're doing here. They believe in me as a future senior leader at this organization. So equally as emotional and powerful in a, in a very different context, but trying to keep the theme of um, we are a tribe, we are going to support each other. And it's really great to see how they support e each other in those presentations. And that's not the end, because one of the things that we um, really shifted a few years ago, it used to be that the different programs, before we had this one, it was sort of, if you get nominated to one of these programs, you know, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. I'm about transparency. I'm about giving tools and talking about things, and if we have to change it, then we change it, because everybody already knows. So we really support our leaders to go back to their teams, and do much of the work around purpose that we've done during those sessions. And we encourage them to take it to their leaders. And we really make sure they talk about their experience and they, they show a little vulnerability about what their journey has been about. So it's really around creating a domino effect. Now we've had um, close to 150 leaders go through this first-hand experience, um, but by estimates, a few thousand who've been impacted by this program. And even in our annual um, engagement survey, we see that these leaders, we have quite high engagement in general at Ericsson, but they're all um, getting higher scores than the average at Ericsson, which is extremely high. It's also led to other things, to be inspired for us to get involved in other types of purpose-driven uh, initiatives. So perhaps some of you have heard about this initiative where we're, um, it's about 200 leaders around the world who are rallying around 17 concepts to really address three key areas that they hope to address in, in 15 years. And it's around extreme poverty, how do we stomp that out? How do we really work on the fight for inequality and injustice? And actually, how do we fix this climate change issue? And these are the members of our executive team at Ericsson. And I'm really proud of all of them because they're extremely committed to these initiatives. It's not just about holding up a plaque. They really believe in this. And people at Ericsson see this and they say, wow, how can we use this to make smart, good business decisions that are also impacting the world, our society. So when I was thinking uh, about this presentation, um, 
I guess for me, it's, it's been a, a personal journey also. And it, it's been a journey, first of all, perhaps from uh, intellectual, professional journey in terms of saying, this is something we should do. This sort of unorthodox, uncomfortable at times initiative is something that we should really invest in. Because it is a big investment, both time, money, focus. But it's also been a very personal journey for me as well. And I've been afforded to really um, have the pleasure of supporting leaders uh, in this journey with them. And I actually thought, like many of you who raised your hand, I've actually done purpose work, which well, I thought for many years now. And um, then a while back, uh, I met uh, Nick Craig, who's now a friend of mine. He's one of the co-authors of the field book of, of True North. And he said, great, Selena, yeah, look, tell me about your purpose. And I was very proud because I'm a really good HR professional and I have very clever things to say about what my purpose is. And I, I told it to him and it had a lot to do with high performance and high performance people and I'm high performance and high performance organization. Um, and he said, ah, that, that's great. That was great, Selena. Um, he said it was, it was a, little, a little long. Um, you kind of had to read it. I mean, yeah, but I mean, you know, I felt quite proud of this. And he said, I wonder, do you feel it in your gut? Does it hit you? And I immediately got really pissed off. I'm like, who is this guy? What is he telling me about my purpose? This is personal. <laughs> and I walked away from there and I thought, shit, that's not my purpose. I'm not feeling that high performance thing. Right? I think it's important, but that's not my purpose. My purpose isn't to make you high performing. Does that even work? But then I got to do some additional work on it. And for me, what formulated is that my purpose is to help others get to the top of their tree to enjoy the view. Now, I'm not sure if you get it, but it hits me every time I say it. And I know what it means, and I can remember it, and I feel it. So the last tidbit that I wanted to share, um, if you haven't collected one yet, is I had the distinct uh, pleasure to have uh, quite an intimate dinner with Jane Goodall uh, in November. Circumstances, I, I am lucky I happen to be at the right place at the right time sometimes. and. Um, she was telling us about all of her work um, and really talking about her travel schedule and talking about how passionate she was as an activist, um, trying to make the world a better place. She will be 82 in a, in a few weeks. She actually doesn't have a permanent home because she's traveling all the time. I just was in awe because she's a really beautiful woman also, so, so vital as an 82-year-old. And just saying that you know she was... We met in Denver, Colorado, but she was there, then off to London, and then she was going to Tanzania, and after that she was going to Australia. And I just thought, oh shit, I'm tired just listening to this. Jane, when are you going to slow down? Isn't it about time? And she looked at me, and she smiled in such a, a nice way, and she said, Selena, the way I see it, for every day that goes by, my time on this earth is getting shorter and shorter. So the way I see it, I need to speed up. Thank you. <clears throat>